The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Now today it's kind of a, unusual. I, I, I hummed and hawed about taking this one on for a while and talked to a few other radio hosts that had this guest on, so I thought I would go for it. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we're going to be talking about Hate Crime Hoax. Now, that, that's the title of the book with How the Left is Selling a Fake Race War. And uh, the uh, author, Wilfred Riley, is joining us today. Um, thank you for taking the time, uh, Wilfred. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks to you guys for uh, having me on the show. By the way, small world. I've stayed in the Palmer House for probably 50 times, going back to high school athletic events, business conferences. I'm from Chicago. So, yeah, that's a, that's a great chunk of town where you were, and it is absolutely true that if you're in downtown Chicago, people aren't going to walk up to you and shoot you with a semi-automatic. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the city. That's true of most places, by the way. That's one of the things I write about, kind of the irrational fear people have of others, white, black, southerners, and so on. I, I, I like that concept, and that's sort of why I, I wanted it on the show. But l let me tell you the one, the, one, um, the one thing that held me back from, from um, getting a hold of you sooner. Okay. It was, just the, it, was, it was the part of the title that said, How the Left is Selling a Fake Race War. And, and so that, that struck me back as saying that it, it makes it sound like you, you're aiming it at a particular group of people. And it makes it sound like it's plan, planned, like it's, it's a, you know, people sit down, get together, and kind of initiate fake hoaxes to create a oh. race problem. Now, and it, so, so is that kind of your overall thought? Is that what you believe? Well, well, there are a couple different things there. First of all, in general, the author doesn't pick the title of the book. Um, the publisher is going to pick something that's going to attract eyes, that's going to sell books. I've already negotiated kind of a dull, nonpartisan title for my next book, uh, Taboo, which will be coming out in about six months. But uh, So that's very common. I mean, if you ever talk to a science fiction author like S.M. Sterling, who's a Facebook uh, friend of mine, uh, and you ask them about, you know, the half-naked Amazon women on the cover of their books, which turn out to be these very intelligent analyses, and, you know, the gold rush with some historical facts change. What they'll say is, I mean, obviously I don't paint the cover, Riley. I mean, so there, there's a bit of the same thing there. Uh, the book was designed, it's from one of the largest kind of, not crazy, but center-right presses, and that's, that's something that they uh, wanted to go with as the title of the book. I will say, though, that... One of the problems, and you're not talking when you talk about the left, about every union worker in America that votes for the Democratic Party. Right. Um, but one of the things that is very real in the United States is that there's a substantial grievance industry based on the activist left. So if you actually look at what I say in my book, I look at many different categories of hate hoaxes. And in fact, I say that the most dangerous, disturbing category is the growing number of hate hoaxes on kind of the white all right. So you've recently seen a surge toward identity politics in the USA on both sides. So a fairly large percentage of hate hoaxes over the very recent past, the past two to three years, uh, like Brianna Harmon in Texas, involved conservative whites claiming they've been attacked by minorities. So I don't just focus on one block of the country there. But I didn't feel wildly uncomfortable with the, uh, the left phrasing in the title. Because in reality, I mean, entire sectors of American modern life, whether you're talking about affirmative action, which now extends well beyond African Americans, my group, to recent uh, foreign immigrants of color, for example, whether you're talking about minority set-asides, I mean, I, for example, could buy a radio station at about 66% of regular cost. It's a business myself and some of my friends have actually looked into. Whether you're talking about the budgets for these massive activist groups, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, for example, has recently gone through some troubles. We don't need to go into it in detail. But um, they have a well-invested endowment of $432 million. The justification for all of that is this idea that America is still an existentially racist country filled with bloody conflict between the populations that we have here. And I do think that idea is concentrated on the left. 
And I do think that when you have an incident that is an extraordinarily obvious hoax, like uh, Jesse Smollett very recently, right. I mean, this is a man who claimed that in the young professional neighborhood of my hometown, a city at least one of you guys have just visited, this is a neighborhood that's probably 20% black, upper middle class black, like 15% gay. Uh, he was attacked by two Trump supporters wearing, quote-unquote, patriotic ski masks, red MAGA hats. They literally had a noose, a gallon bottle of bleach. They beat him and they yelled racial slurs. When people say stuff like this that is often obviously questionable, you don't want to say it's obviously fake right up front, there tends to be a pretty predictable coterie of people that support and promote that. So... I mean, the large civil rights groups, uh, National Action Network was involved with that. Um, Urban League was involved with that. Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition, which you may have seen at downtown Chicago, involved with that, SPLC. So I do think that there are people, mostly on the left, quite a few on the alt-right, that have an interest in promoting this idea of ongoing serious conflict in the USA. And I think that's a mostly fake narrative. If you unpack, and speaking here as a social scientist, not as a you know, center-right writer or something, if you unpack most of these narratives, whether it's whites are being attacked by blacks, there's an entire book uh, focusing on that, a white girl bleed a lot, you find that that's not really the case. But on the other hand, if you look at the idea that cops are shooting down black men in the streets, you find that that's not really the case. So I, I do think there's an element of selling. I think there are people that are media figures or activists that take extremely rare incidents and overpromote them for money or for prominence. So you're saying that this is, is it more a political agenda or is it a financial, both, or is there something else? That's, that's a great question. I think it depends whether you're talking about the hoaxer, who tends to just be some regular schlub, some college kid that wants to make a point, often sympathetic characters, or you're talking about the people that back the hoax. So at the first level, I mean, kind of the pitch line for my book is that if you look at most of the kind of high-profile, widely reported hate crime incidents over the past four or five years, I don't think ethically I could extend the most claim beyond that, but uh, Jussie Smollett, a week before that, Covington Catholic, uh, Yasmin Saweed, young woman, claimed that white Trump supporters attacked her and tore her hijab. Uh, Eastern Michigan, there was the claim of just vile graffiti targeting black students. Air Force Academy, where if you followed that, a literal general, Jay Silveria, had to show up to campus and speak against what he thought was racist violence. Uh, Grand Rapids, where a young black girl claimed that white men literally urinated on her. Uh, Key in College, with the death threats sent to every black student on campus via social media. Wisconsin Parkside, that's the case with the nooses all over campus. Uh, the UVA rape, where the claim was that the fraternities were holding story of O-style anti-feminist rape rings back to Duke Lacrosse. All those cases have turned out to be fake. So leaving aside kind of the, the partisan discussion there, there's a really interesting scientific question of why. You don't normally see a 55%, say, rate of false reporting in a category of crime at all. Uh, I think in terms of why people do this at the individual level, people tend to commit crimes for uh, almost tawdry, petty, personal reasons. Money is the big one. Uh, perhaps sex, if you're talking about assault or prostitution, local notoriety. And hate hoaxers themselves seem to commit crimes for pretty much the same reasons. Um, so, I mean, a case that comes to mind that's just absolutely typical is the third case in my third chapter is uh, Continental Spices Cash and Carry, which is a popular um, Arab-American-owned grocery store in, I believe, Everett, Washington. Uh, the store burned to the ground, and there were these slurs written around the, what was left of the place, like, you know, Arab, go home, this kind of offensive crap. And the insurance investigation was expedited a little bit by the fact that this looked obviously like a hate attack on the poor owner of the store through some very complex police work. It was eventually exposed as a hoax. But why would you fake a hate crime? I mean, very often it's something like that. You want to have an excuse for shuttering your business. You want to get some insurance money, that kind of thing. The reason that I talk about the activist left, and now also, as I said, the activist alt-right, is that there are people that take and promote these stories. So obviously, as you guys know, you guys are media figures, there's an element of selection bias in what gets reported um, in national or regional news, and hate crime stories almost always do. And there is a very predictable group of supporters that will emerge from the woodwork whenever one of these stories uh, arises. If it involves a Muslim-American individual, for example, you're going to get CARE, the Council for American-Islamic Relations. And I think at that level, 
there is some practical interest in promoting the idea of conflict so that groups like this can present themselves as still being necessary. I don't think that's conspiratorial. It's just sort of common sense. Um, the reality in the USA is that without ever excusing, obviously there's still racism here. That's probably one of the curses of man, tribalism. Uh, I'm from Illinois, and I still get irritated when I see someone in a Michigan jersey. So, but with, <laughs> without excusing... But without excusing that reality of racism, I mean, the USA desegregated in 1954. By that point, the Midwest, the West Coast were literally fairly well desegregated. 1965 was the Civil Rights Act. 1967 was affirmative action. So there's just not a great deal of violent interracial crime. Eighty-five uh, percent of white murder victims, 94 percent of black murder victims are killed by people of their own race that they knew. So if your whole argument is there's a serious problem here, we need to fight this ongoing bigotry, you're going to need some bigotry to illustrate that. So when one of these cases emerges, it immediately becomes a media favorite. That inevitably happens with any case involving, say, an unarmed black man shot by the cops. That immediately happens where, with any case where it looks like whites and blacks, those specific races are beating each other over the head. And a great deal of those cases in the end game turn out to be frauds in both those situations. There's just really no way to deny that. Well, now, it, you, you mentioned the case of Jesse Smollett, and I, I was surprised, and I digress a little bit here, I was surprised okay. that being in Chicago, uh, the overall uh, appearance, or the overall opinion, rather, of the cases, they think it was a hoax. And that was sort of surprising to me. But everybody that I talked to about this said, oh, that it, was a, it was a hoax, it was a setup. He, he, he created that, and I was sort of surprised mm -hmm. by that, actually. And what do you, I guess the question would be, why are you surprised by that? I mean, in this case, just one comment, um, I mean, I'm still friendly with some police and legal sources in the city where I lived as a professional for a while. I mean, my understanding is that there's a video of the two Nigerian brothers involved in this case, the Osan Dario brothers, uh, buying the rope, the red hats, and the um, ski mask that were used in the attack. And they're doing so with kind of a handwritten shopping list from Jesse Smollett. So, I mean, you can Google that. This isn't just me talking on the radio. You can Google that by checking uh, Nigerian Brothers Buy Rope, comma, Items. That's from CBS. <laughs> it's live on YouTube. So, I mean, there really is no doubt, I would say, that Jesse Smollett at least had some role in this case. I mean, are, yeah, are you asking yeah. why people... Are you at... Uh, why are... Okay, I'm kind of rambling here. What, what about the reaction from most people, uh, if I can ask, surprised you? Well, I was, you know, being in a city, when you live in a city, you, you tend to support the people that live there was, was my premise. And, and to have most everybody say that it was, uh, it was set up, it sort of, sort of shocked me. Uh, I agree with you. It was obvious it was a setup. But just being in the city itself, uh, being part of that, it just seemed like that they would, uh, I guess your support your, uh, favorite son, perhaps. Maybe that's a bad word to use, but maybe just rally around. Uh, someone who lived there, and it, it, it sort of surprised me. Of course, I'm, I'm like you said, it's obvious based on all the evidence. But uh, that was just it was just uh, something that uh, that I noticed when I was there. No, I, I, first of all, I think that's a positive. I mean, I definitely do think that when a crime involves one of your kinsmen, like I'm a black guy, I tend to have that syndrome where I'll deny that black celebrities are guilty at least a little bit. Uh, I see the same thing. I'm, I live in Kentucky now with the southern white guys that I play ball with or play golf with. If a country star were arrested and accused of something, I, I suspect you'd hear some defenses and deflections there. But, no, at, at some level we do have to say, even though this guy looks like he could be a distant relative of mine, he's still obviously a thief or a rapist or whatever the situation might be. In Jesse Smollett's case, a liar. Um, and, I mean, if you look at the evidence here, and I think we've already summarized a lot of it. I won't go on at windy lengths, but, I mean, even aside from the video that, you know, we just discussed for your uh, listeners, the, the two brothers involved themselves say that Smollett paid them to commit the attack. I mean, so they have, they've signed written confessions that the police have in custody right now. The police have a signed check from, the bro from Smollett to the brothers for $3,500, which was described by both of them as the exact cost of the beating. There's something like 16 phone calls between Smollett and the brothers over the couple of days before and after the attack. Um, and, I mean, legally, this wasn't an acquittal. Uh, Smollett still had to pay at least $10,000 as a fine. He forfeited his entire bond amount, which was not small. 
Uh, he was either given credit for pretty substantial community service or a side new service. The figure used was 18 hours. So these aren't things that happen with innocent defendants. You don't win your case and then receive a sentence of two weeks of community service and a $10,000 fine. So, no, I think very few people would deny that Smollett either definitely or probably did this. And that that's the case to the point where you're seeing jokes about it now. I mean, Chris Rock was hilarious at the Image Awards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're changing your name to Jesse. You lost that respect from the black community. That's one of that's one of the funnier lines I've heard recently. You know, yeah. People know what happened. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I, I, at at this point, but um, do you see it going to? Is it going to continue? Is this going to like these things get caught? Like with with Jesse, he's um. He's been caught. It's it's kind of exposed. Uh, does it make it harder for the next hoaxer? Well, I think that d probably not, because the issue isn't whether you get caught for a crime. Uh, it's whether you get punished for a crime. Um, in Smollett's case, in Smollett's case, by the way, I think that there's going to be so much ridicule that the next very rich guy probably wouldn't do this. I mean, so when we talk about privileges in society, is there white privilege. Does affirmative action confer black privilege? The real privilege is wealth. I mean, Smollett was a, he was probably the second lead on Empire, paid $67,000 an episode. He was very much a part of that dinner party elite social scene and probably the world's fifth or sixth city. So it's not entirely surprising nothing happened to him. I don't think we need to get into wild conspiracy theories about that. But um, the, the level of ridicule is going to make it very difficult for him to resume his career in any normal way. So a filthy rich guy might think twice. But the simple fact is that Smollett received almost no legal punishment. I mean, the fine he got would have been substantial to me or you, or at least to me. But, I mean, that's a sixth of what he makes per show. Um, his He didn't receive a criminal record. His record was expunged. At the end of the proceedings, that's something his lawyer asked for in the last hearing, which is almost unprecedented. Um, yeah, the very little happened to him, and that's a, that's a problem across hate crime hoaxes in general. Looking through my book, I would say that probably in 60% of cases, no one's punished for an obvious hoax at all. If you talk about college campuses, for example, what normally happens is police officers will just declare the investigation closed without explaining why. Um, and that was actually a problem for my data set, which I probably could have doubled if I'd included all those cases as hoaxes. But that, that's the most common resolution. They just sort of say, for some reason, we can't find any evidence, and they shutter the case. Uh, when people are prosecuted, it's generally for a single misdemeanor charge of filing a false police report. So I think as long as there's a massive incentivization around these cases, I mean, every case that I looked at was regionally or nationally reported. So as long as people are saying these cases are evidence of a broader wave, you know, the Trump surge in racism, this is Trump's America, uh, and they convey with them, you know, kind of a sense of popularity or a sense of recognition, and the punishment is a $50 misdemeanor ticket, I think you'll probably see more of these cases, actually. Do you think this is some sort of by proxy? Do you think there's some sort of mental issue going on with people that do this sort of thing? for attention well that's something that i actually thought about ethically um before writing my book because you don't want to cruelly make fun of quote-unquote crazy people and what i decided and i think every legal system that's existed since salon the judge has had to make this decision is just doing evil does not by definition mean that you're crazy so that's an argument people will try to make he killed a woman he must be mad and no sane person could do that he faked a hate crime. There must be mental illness. We can't imprison him. No sane person would do that. In fact, we find that one of the, the most prominent motivator for these crimes at the individual level is insurance money. Um, if you burn down your store, I'm talking about Continental Spices, Cash and Carry. I'm talking about Paris, Texas. I'm talking about Velvet Rope, Ultra Lounge. If you set your business on fire and collect a $200,000 check, you're not insane. There's no mental problem there. I do think that one of the things that incentivizes this behavior, though, is the odd value that Americans have begun to place on victimhood, which I would not define as a mental issue. I think people that, for example, fake a hate hoax and then launch a collegiate rally on the basis of that are very aware of what they're doing. So it's not a mental illness, but it is an odd change to the human fabric. Um, I think that there's no doubt that in entire arenas of society, the collegiate campus, 
the left-leaning media, if you just read an article on Jezebel or Vox or HuffPost sometime, the idea is that being a victim is something that gives you more right to speak than other people. So you frequently see people begin sentences with, um, you know, as a black bisexual woman, I feel you don't have a right to tell me about my truth. Or as a fat, gay, um, transgender individual, I don't feel you have a right to tell me about my truth. You're now seeing some of the same thing on the right, you know, as a Christian. And the question is, what does any of that have to do with whatever we're talking about, say, tax policy? But that focus on victimization as a source of agency, as a source of power, is tied into people falsely claiming to be victims. People do things that they think represent power or coolness or success. And it's odd to me that at this point in time in our society, one of the things that represents those things is being defeated, is being a victim. But I, I think that does play into these cases. But most of the actors' actions of the hoaxers themselves are uh, pretty logical. Mm -hmm. I mean, Smollett had no problem, you know, getting to spot X at time Y. He had no problem writing a check for amount Z. He had no problem preparing shopping lists. So I don't think he's crazy in any real sense of that term, any ethical sense of that term. I think he's responding to perverse incentives in a logical manner. Yeah, but I, I, isn't it to the point where um, I think what I'm saying is I'm looking at it like um, how much self-esteem or what, what problem have you got when you're already a millionaire and you have to go out and create such a... Um, you know, uh, like I've been victimized. I was beaten and choked and called names and thrown down the street or um, whatever the case. Um, like, you see what I'm saying? Like, like what, what's going on in your mind, in your soul, when you're doing that? Um, it's, I'm not talking like someone like Madonna running around with a little wedding dress on and playing with herself on stage to get attention, to get more. <laughs> I'm talking about <laughs> someone actually doing something that's, um, you know, because Jess, Jesse, that's a, that's a big, big case because of how much money he has. But there's a lot of the smaller ones, you know, the, the girl that says I was raped and, you know, she's got Al Sharpton up there and crying and stuff like that and it never happened. What's really wrong with her, but... Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm not sure that psychologically anything is wrong with her, but this actually gets into some of the writing I do in political psychology. So, I mean, it's interesting. First of all, I think that in law of medicine, there's a pretty definite definition of insanity. And as I understand, the two components of it are you can't tell reality from fantasy, and you absolutely can't tell right from wrong. Not that you do wrong, but that you don't understand the difference between them. So an example of insane behavior would be challenging the president to a knife duel because you think he's an alien from Romulus. So you don't understand that that's actually Barack Obama up there or Donald Trump or whoever, one. And two, you are, you've gone mad. You don't under, you're ignoring the moral or normative restrictions in your society. And I think that's what most people mean by insanity. Um, in Chicago, unfortunately, we need to take care of these people. But you'll see people wandering around downtown screaming at strangers walking by and the people who aren't there and that's what we mean by insanity um in terms of sort of insane imperfect behavior uh quote-unquote promiscuity all that's often not unhealthy at all aggression dishonesty i don't think we can consider those mental conditions or everyone's insane um, my person, I mean, he told a lie, he must be mad. This has been an argument, by the way, that line is from one of Shakespeare's plays. This has been an argument for unscrupulous defense attorneys for a while. And it basically breaks down to how dare you attack my client, you aggressive upper middle class bum, don't you see he's a victim of mental illness? And I think it's really important to avoid that with most of these hate hoaxers. I mean, this guy's Smollett who showed up, check in his pocket, and staged a three-man fistfight for ten minutes, that's not crazy behavior. No. Um, it can be crazy behavior, you know, quotes in the air, but that, that is not something that a mentally ill person is generally going to be able to do. Um, my personal belief, and I think this is very borne out by years in the trading floor sector and then in academia watching people go for tenure, most people are basically good but amoral. Um, 
most people would do things that we consider dishonorable, from a sexual favor to giving someone a beating to driving past them on the road. If that was tied into something like a job promotion, like I said, I've just seen my cohort go through that tenure process. Um, if that was tied to something like a substantial amount of money, if that was tied into, say, leaving a partner for someone you were more attracted to. And I think that's the kind of calculus that Smollett or someone like that is doing. I mean, that, that's a lot of money involved. He wanted to double his salary on Empire. So if you told me, if you hit your buddy in the face off camera, we'll get to split 67,000 times $26, I'd probably do it. I mean, I don't think that there's all that mysterious of a motivator for a lot of these people. I mean, there's money, there's recognition. And I think that Jesse Smollett made not an insane, but a very practical call. I think he decided to take the risk of arrest or whatever it was in exchange for the probability of getting X amount of money. Hmm. You just have to wonder how much is enough. Like, where would it stop then? I think that we're getting almost into questions where I feel like I should kind of refer to my priest. And I'm not saying that mockingly, but just so we're not we're not talking about insanity. I think we're on the same page there. But when does when does the little le petite, uh, le petite mort, the little madness, the little death of life, when does that cross the line and make you someone that should be institutionalized? Or when does that make you someone that people need to start keeping an eye on? I don't know. That's a fascinating human question. When is it enough? I think that depends on what you're used to. So, yeah, I mean, I grew up in the hood, for example. Yeah. So I grew up on the south. I was born on the south side of Chicago, and I grew up on the east side of nearby Aurora, um, which at the time, both of those were among the 10 or so most violent cities in the country. And I went on to make myself reasonably successful as an athlete for a while, as a business person for a while. Um, I went to academia because I like teaching kids. I actually went to a historically black college in Appalachia because I thought there'd be two groups of people there I could actually teach something to. So money's not personally all that important to me. Um, and I kind of just jokingly said, well, I'd hit somebody in a criminal scenario for a million dollars, which is probably true given those options. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not one of the motivators in my life to a great extent. On the other hand, if you're a child of wealth, as I understand Smollett was, and you've been in an even wealthier, more privileged setting for a while, you would probably come to view that as normal. And you would also come to view money as a measure of how much you were respected. I've noticed that very wealthy people tend to see money that way. It's kind of the score clock for the game. So what would you do for more money? I mean, that would probably depend on your individual perspective. So I think that enough would be a very different figure for Jussie Smollett than it would be for a guy who's a carpenter in Chicago. Hmm. What, what, are you, what are you hoping that um, people take away from your book. So uh, w when they get through the book, um, what, is, what is the main objective? Like, what would you hope that they got from it? Knowledge, really. I think that this is one of the things with my writing. Uh, if you look at my bio online, it says, first of all, a bunch of jokes that I wrote in there when I was in my first year in um, academia you know, my interests include blank. But one of the things that it does say that's absolutely accurate is Dr. Will Riley's interest include using modern quantitative methods to test sort of sacred cow theories. And what that means is that there are a whole bunch of theories, like white privilege on the left, that exist and that are very influential in society, but that are very rarely tested. So, for example, it's actually pretty easy to put, I did this for one of my research projects, it's fairly easy to put together a scale of 100 questions that you think measure privilege pretty accurately. And when I did this, they ranged from I have never been beaten up by more than two people to I know what frequent flyer miles are to I have had an internship. And all of those things, I think, obviously are measures of having had a somewhat softer life than is possible. And I, I had a couple people vet through the list, add things of their own, remove things that could have been offensive or frightening, all of that. But uh, when I gave this, uh, this scale to people... It turns out that if you adjust for everything but race, there is a 2 or 3% difference in the score of the average white guy and the average black guy, with the black guy getting the worst of it. And that's probably a pretty accurate measure of how racism affects two equally middle-class guys in modern society. But another thing that I found was that about 80% of privilege was just social class. The biggest predictor of quote-unquote privilege by far was how much money you had. Or if you were a young person, a person under 25, how much money your family had. 
And at some level, that's pretty unsurprising. But I mean, the effect of race on privilege was, since everything is not always identical, let's call it five points. But the effect of class was 70 or 80 points. So that's an example of testing a sacred cow theory. And most of my other writing, whether it's alt-wrongs, which is my next book, Criticizing the Alt-Right, which is a crazy movement, or it's this book, or just kind of taking on the social justice left and pointing out, look, two-thirds of these crimes are bullshit, excuse the language. Um, the point is that people will gain knowledge that they didn't previously have, which sounds corny, but is accurate. So putting together the book, I mean, I compiled a data set of what's right now 516 confirmed hate hoaxes. Um, anyone, again, right, left, whatever, can access that. Just contact me. We'll talk about that, probably how to do that. But, I mean, I'll, I'll send it to you. But I want people to be aware that this image of massive racial conflict you see in the media, whites and blacks hitting each other over the head with sticks, you know, high school girls getting peed on in public in Grand Rapids, that's not happening. These stories are almost inevitably, at the upper level, the most promoted stories, fakes. There are, of course, real hate crimes targeting our gay countrymen, targeting Orthodox Jews, and so on. But these Jussie Smollett and Covington Catholic and so on stories are not real. And once you realize that, I think, one, that's a positive realization, but two, that's going to affect how you move forward when it comes to engaging racism or whatever. What, what do you think the actual percentage is of real hate crimes as, as compared to the hoaxes, do you think? Like, what's made up of hoaxes? Half of them or three quarters? Like what? Well, it, it's important to be uh, kind of honest about the numbers that we're using here. So first of all, it's kind of hard to estimate. In the book, I say 15 to 50 percent, which is a conservative estimate. But it's also so far ranging, it's kind of worthless. So I'll try to do a better one here. Um, it depends what you mean. So over a period of, let's say, five years, I have, let's say, 450 hate hoaxes because some are outside of that window. Now, the response to that from someone that's arguing from a social justice perspective is, well, there's 7,000 hate crimes reported every year, so you're just focusing on a few isolated cases and trying to make a name around that. There are two problems with that, though. That's something I thought about as well, writing. Again, I'm not an extreme partisan on either side. Um, the first point is that only about one in ten hate crime hopes, hate crimes is widely reported enough, by which I mean national or regional media, that a researcher like myself, using normal ethical channels, could even access it. So the data set of hate crimes that I'm working with is not 7,000 a year. It's about 700 a year. Because by definition, any case for me to prove it wrong would have to be nationally reported and then nationally debunked. So I don't see any reason that the rate of hopes among those cases that were would be higher or lower than among those cases that weren't, but that's a fact. So... Over a five-year period, say 700 cases a year, I'm going with the upper end 10% estimate, that's 3,500 cases. And I've got 450 hoaxes. So, I mean, that's, that's about a 15% false reporting rate. But the problem secondarily is that there's a distinction between reports and convictions. So in most areas of the law, like murder, where it's kind of hard to ignore a body laying in the driveway, mm. um, burglary, where there's somebody in your house, the report rate is almost identical to the crime rate, uh, the conviction rate, the pursuit rate. That's not true in this arena. So the conviction rate in reported hate crime cases seems to be about 3 to 5%. Uh, it's sometimes reached as high as 10% in individual states. But in California, for example, if you look at 2016, which is a representative year I used in the article I'm putting together from the book, um, there were 931 reported hate crimes. But there were only 220 that were sent on to the prosecution, which is a very basic standard that just means, look, we don't think this is a hoax and we have a suspect. Not in custody, just a suspect. Um, of those 220 cases that went forward to this most basic level, 51 resulted in convictions. So, I mean, if you apply that same rate, say 6%, to the cases nationally, over five years you've got 3,500 nationally reported cases, You've got 450 fakes, and you've got, you know, 200 definite convictions in serious cases. So, I mean, it's, it's very arguable. I haven't proven this yet, but it's very arguable there are more hoaxes than there are convictions. And then there are a huge number of cases that exist in this gray area, where, for example, you have the N-word written on a bench. And the question becomes, who wrote this on the bench? Was it white supremacist, was it black kids screwing around, depending on how they spelled it, no one knows. 
So again, I would say my estimate would be you know, probably around half adding in the ambiguous cases never happened. Uh, you can definitely prove that about 15 or 20 percent of them never happened. I think those are reasonable estimates. Do you know, um, but this, you know, these cases, um, like with the, the, the Jesse, I'm not calling him Jesse, he, uh, and the case where he did what he did and he faked it, as, um, does he not realize that it sets back the whole idea of, of um, gays being attacked or blacks being attacked and, and the whole, the, it hurts the whole effort by what he does, even though he's looking at it as an increase in salary. Uh, do people like that not realize what, what, what happens? Well, criminals tend to be fairly bad people. I mean, all of us have the potential to be bad people. I mean, the number of people engaged in the crime of music piracy or something is pretty identical to everyone, the crime of speeding. But if you're actually doing something that's chargeable as a felony and that the police department is going to bother to pursue, you're probably not the most moral guy in the world. So I think that there's been a tendency in the USA since about the 1970s, since the book The Crime of Punishment came out, which is directly in my field, to sort of romanticize crime, like crime is the side effect of racism. Well, then why are most criminals white? You know, crime is the side effect of poverty. Well, why was Jesse a millionaire? Um, I think in reality, Jesse Smollett probably didn't give a damn about young gay boys three years from now in Memphis who might not be believed because of him. I think he wanted a million dollars. Um, I don't, so I don't necessarily know without trying to psychoanalyze him how much he really thought about that. But yeah, that is, obviously that's one of the worst effects of hate crime hoaxing. Um, you know, banter and the funny stories in the book aside, the problem with hate crime hoaxes, and I'll also say the problem with what seems to be a wave of fake sexual assault claims on the campus, or with redefining things like Joe Biden put his hand on my back as sexual assault, <laughs> the problem with this is that people... Well, that's certainly a gave me a neck rub. I mean, I don't approve of it, of course. But the problem with all of this crap is that people who've been raped, which is a horrible thing most guys can't really conceive of, people that actually have had their butt kicked by five people who are white or black or whatever, those people aren't going to be believed because half the cases are jokes. Yeah, that's a real problem. I think the one thing that law and order conservative types and people who genuinely care about victims can agree on is that we really need to punish the hell out of people that fake these incidents because they do a great deal of damage. Um, not only to race relations, not only to belief in the next wave of victims, but just empirically in cash money terms. I mean, Jesse Smollett costs Chicago, the estimate I've seen is $1.7 million. So all those cops and all those federales that were scrolling through you know, tape from these pleasant high-rise buildings and that were following Smollett around as a security detail, those guys could have been out there catching rapists, and they weren't because of this guy. Yeah. Yeah, it's wasting a lot of resources and time and, and 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 attention. But I guess that's what he that's what he's looking for, you know. Wow. So now, what what have you got coming up next for yourself? Well, I'm doing a I'm a writer. I mean, that's that's one of the great things about being a faculty member, especially if you're tenured. I mean, you get paid to sit around and think. So, I mean, one of the next two books I have coming out is called Alt-Wrongs, and it's a logical look at the problems with the alt-right movement, which I do feel that the right has sometimes kind of winked and nodded at. And there are quite a few of them. To some extent, because nobody actually responds to the alt-right, if the idea is we don't want to talk to those quote-unquote red-pilled idiots, this sort of thing, if you look at 4chan, if you look at 8chan, is becoming very popular. I mean, a lot of what are almost neo-Nazi talking positions are being used in common Internet debate. So I wrote about a 200-page book, it looks like I have a buyer for that, that just points out some of the obvious problems with the alt-right, like the confusion of the genetic with the cultural. So the argument is, for example, blacks score slightly worse on IQ tests than whites. Uh, Hispanics sometimes score more poorly than African Americans. And I just point out some of the obvious facts there. Like, I mean, the average IQ for Irishmen, which is half of my ancestry, in the USA was about 75 in 1900. Um, there, there were massive tests that we did of all the males in the country during World War One and World War II. Uh, blacks at the time scored ahead of uh, Irish Americans, Italians, Russians, a whole bunch of other people. So these are obviously changeable things. I mean, for Hispanics, I would assume you might be getting slightly s lower scores because many Hispanics don't read English very well yet. So if you're taking the SAT, that's going to kind of affect the old verbal. So I talk about that. I talk about the idea of nationalism as versus the idea of racial identity. 
Um, I say that diversity is generally a good thing, assuming it's managed. But large societies like Rome, the USSR, Brazil, America, large rich societies are always diverse. Where you have pure, quote-unquote, Vikings or Zulus, you're probably talking about a violent backwater area of the world. So I, I criticize the alt-right. I think they're wrong on IQ. I think that they're wrong on nationalism. That, that tends to be civic, the Roman eagle. It's not a racial thing. Uh, the alt-right tends to think that Western society demands white people. I think that's pretty nonsensical as a black guy. So I, I yell at the alt-right for a while in this book. Uh, the next, the other book is called Taboo, The Difficulty and Importance of Discussing Race and Class. And I talk about a lot of the myths on both the black side and the white side. Like, many whites would deny that any sort of white privilege or residual racism exists at all. And I mean, I think to some extent that's clearly false. But I also talk about some of the myths in the black community, like the idea that the police are out there murdering black men. Actually, I'm one of the first people to do this after Heather McDonald, the center right writer for Manhattan Institute. But I actually take a representative year, 2016, and I look at police shootings. And in that year, there were only 1,200 people nationally that were shot by the police. Um, of those, 258 total were black, about a little over 20%. And only 17 of them were unarmed black men shot by white cops. So the entire Black Lives Matter narrative, which faded for a bit, but's now coming back as we approach an election year, is based on nonsense. 78% uh, of the people shot by the police are white. Uh, the difference, black people are a little overrepresented, but that difference goes away if you adjust for crime rate, which is slightly but definitely higher in black communities. So I, I look at just some of the things that both sides say and talk about what the facts are and how we can talk about them. So there's taboo, there's alt wrongs, and, and then I'm just you know living my life as well. I also like to play basketball, play golf, sleep, drink beer. <laughs> well, I, I have a I have a parting comment. I think we're about out of time, but uh, in in my speaking, I, I give a program uh, across the country, which is when I was in Chicago, on on okay. how to detect liars and what what these people who are claiming that they've been attacked or claiming that somebody else did to them, they need to work very extensively on their lying skills. <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Uh, do, do you have contact information? So if people want to tell you about, I don't know, maybe a hoax, <laughs> what, what's your contact information for people? Sure. Uh, so a couple things. First of all, and um, I'll give that a second, but first of all, I agree with um, your, your guest talking about lying is a skill. Mm -hmm. So in law school, I went to the University of Illinois, and many law schools, although obviously they'll teach you to use your powers for good, will discuss how to lie and how to detect lying. And so I've actually been in sessions where people were calmly and confidently looking each other in the eye with their hands open and just telling these ridiculous lies, like my father, the king, taught me to do when I lived in Egypt. So, I mean, yeah, many of these hoaxers obviously have not had that training. And so there are indicators of a fake hate hoax. Uh, one is the extremely wild cinematic story that I always think of as kind of the I was set upon story. So... An actual hate crime is probably something ugly and crude. It's violence outside a biker bar's back door after closing. Whereas the fake hate hoax is, you know, four men in capes jumped out of the van. They were wearing Irish clover leaves on their face. They beat me bloody with batons. I mean, so that's, that's one way to tell. I mean, another way to tell is body language and so on when the person's being interviewed afterward. Uh, another way to tell is how much evidence there seems to be. Is there a police report or are they just asking for money on Twitter? So that, that's an excellent point. I mean, that's, that's correct, what was said there. In terms of how to get in touch with me, should you be uh, ill-advised enough to want to do so, I'm very social media heavy like most, I guess, younger individuals. So the platform I use the most is just Facebook. I'm W-I-L-F-R-E-D-R-E-I-L-L-Y, Wilfred Riley. I've got a personal page, a fan page. I'm at the point where I have multiple thousands of fans and followers, but at the same time, it I get maybe 10 messages a day. So if you contact me and want to talk about something, I'll definitely get back with you and chop it up with you, talk to you. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I'm Will uh, underscore Duh underscore B-E-E-S-T 630. So Will the Beast 630 at the uh, Twitter platform. And again, I, I welcome anyone that wants to reach out and have a conversation. I've gotten everything from hate hoax tips to uh, death threats and claims that I'm a lunatic Uncle Tom. So it's always entertaining to log on to social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always uh, yeah we work for the government so i know we get it all 
We get it all. Fake news. <laughs> Fake news. Well, it's been yeah, a pleasure. It seems to mean all news to a certain segment of the viewing uh, population. Oh, yeah. It's all, I mean, uh, you know, they, they give me a check and I'll say whatever they want me to say. Yep. Well, I was uh, I was actually a commentator on the Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter Facebook pages, which is a unique combo. But I eventually got rid of both of them because I got tired of knuckleheads yelling at me. But that, to some extent, was anything that was disliked on either page was fake news, like white man put you up to that, huh? Yeah. So, yeah, there, there's not really a standard for it other than news story I don't like or news story, you know, Mr. Trump said is bad or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, um, I hope I hope to get a, a little real news and comment from people. But they're they're more than free to reach out to me and talk to me. Well, fantastic! And uh, we'll um, have your book up on our website, as well as your uh, contact info, so people can just do one click and just spew away what they need to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, it's been it's been our pleasure. It's been very charming. Uh, Wilfred Riley and Hate Crime Hoax. Thank you for being on the show. Sounds good. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.